1 Corinthians. As you know, I typically preach through books of the Bible, and that is section by section, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Sometimes we just take a few verses, and then sometimes we take the whole chapter. Today is one of those days where we are going to take the whole chapter and see it as a whole, and then if we need to come back and uh, deal with more, we will do that uh, next Sunday. Let's once again pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, as your people who have been transformed by your grace, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling within them, we know how precious your word is, and we treasure all of it. And even, Lord, the chapter today, we know that it is inspired by you, profitable for your people. And we just ask for your spirit to do a work in our hearts that only you can do to be able to apply this graciously and faithfully and truthfully. We need wisdom, God. We need your wisdom and how to navigate this life as messy as it can get. We pray, as always, those who do not yet know you in a real and saving way, that you would draw them to yourself, to the gospel, even today, as we celebrate communion and think about Jesus' death. We thank you that we get to stand here forgiven, the hope of eternal life, the assurance of eternal life. We're thankful that we get to sing about it and have something visible today to hold in our hands as we hold the bread and the cup. Remember your atoning death on our behalf. May we use that truth to cause us to live a life that's pleasing to you. Because you died and rose again on our behalf. We're your people, purchased by you. Help us to understand this text today, we pray in Christ's name. All God's people said, amen. I'm going to read the text today. Then we're going to come back and work our way through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'll say it again, Paul started this church. We could read about it in the book of Acts. And he was there for how long? How long? Year and a half? Three years in Ephesus? And he gets reports, now he is already in Ephesus, and he gets a report that things aren't going well with the church he started in Corinth. A very large city, a very multicultural city, uh, a city that uh, now has a new congregation of God's people. And Paul needs to write to them. Uh, they have questions about the Christian faith, which he's going to start to answer not today. Right now, he's dealing with some issues that he heard about. He gets a report, and so he's writing a letter to help them understand the Christian faith better, to, be, to live faithfully. And so we, uh, we'll start in chapter 5, verse 1. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, and an immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles. And here he's using the word Gentiles as those of the nations, like people in our town who don't know the Lord. I mean, they're not even doing this in morality. That someone has his father's wife, stepmother. And you've become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You're like, just spend the rest of the time on that verse, will you? Wow. And you're going to do the whole chapter? Verse 6, you're boasting. Imagine if this is a letter, we're, we're the church at Corinth. Imagine hearing this. I'm reading Paul's letter now. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as, in fact, unleavened. 
you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter, not to associate with immoral people. I didn't at all mean the immoral people of the world, or with the covetous, or swindlers, or the idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. But I actually... I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he is an immoral person, covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? Those who are outside... God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if I were a topical preacher, as many topical preachers are out there, uh, they, get, they just go all throughout the Bible picking a sermon to preach on. They may want to stay away from this chapter because it's uncomfortable. And I was so blessed this morning. A couple people said, Kendall, I read ahead where we're going, and you have a tough chapter, one of the toughest chapters, and I want you to know I'm praying for you. That was a blessing. That was a blessing to read ahead and say, wow, this is, this is, this is God's word, but this is a tough chapter. How do, we, how do we handle it? Well, it's your Bible as well, right? It's your Bible, and the question is, what are we going to do with it? Well, let, we want to obey what it says. We want to look at this text and by God's grace understand what it means first to those first century Christians and then say, how do we apply it to ourselves today? So let's work through it verse by verse. And I want to remind us of some themes that I've already mentioned in Corinth about the whole uh, book. So what makes the Christian assembly unique? Because this is written to a church, an assembly of believers. It is a community of redeemed people. That's what we've seen so far in Corinth. He starts off the book saying that. We are God's field. We're God's building. We are God's temple. We saw that in chapter 3. It is a community that, has, uh, that reminds themselves of their Savior through communion, which we're doing today. It's a community concerned with pleasing God, as we're going to see. We have new ethics. It's a community that exercises God-given spiritual gifts. And today we see that it is a community that disciplines itself. And that's just a few things that you can glean from the book of Corinthians about this community. We'll come back to that later. So let's look at verse 1. Paul gets a report, probably from the businesswoman, Chloe, who travels probably back and forth from Ephesus to Corinth. Paul gets a report. The Greek word for immorality is pornea, which you can guess where we get certain words from in our culture. It is a word, pornea simply means every kind of sexual activity that's outside the boundary of a one woman, one man covenant, covenant marriage. Everything outside, and I should have a circle up here. I used to have a diagram in which I would have a circle and man and a woman in the covenant of marriage God is the one who created that three-letter word. And it's a blessing that God has given to mankind, not just to fill the earth. That would be a whole other sermon. What does the Bible say? It's a gift. Everything outside of that one man, one woman, covenant marriage relationship, everything outside of that is forbidden for God's people. Now, the world's going to do what it's going to do, right? Right? And some of you in here today might say, oh yeah, Kendall, before I was a Christian, I lived a very immoral lifestyle, but I became a Christian and God changed my mind on all kinds of things. We're going to see that in chapter 6. Do you remember in chapter 6 what he said, what made up the church in Corinth? Chapter 6, verse 9. 
Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, or revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But here it is, verse 11. Such were some of you. He gives a list. But what happened? Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Spirit of our God. Something happened. We, we have people in leadership who teach Sunday school and as a pastor and a deacon who fits in that list. We have missionaries that fit in that list. By the way, you may be in that list, and, and maybe your sins aren't in that list that characterized your life before you were a believer. But the only reason that you're a believer is because at one point you recognize that you needed forgiveness. See, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when you become a Christian, not only do we receive the forgiveness of sins, but now we're a new creature in Christ, and we now have new ethics and a new way to live. And so Paul writes to them and said, what's going on? There, there's a type of sexual immorality that's going on there that doesn't even exist out in the culture. Now, by the way, Paul would write something differently today. Like, how many are, like, every month you're, like, shocked at what's coming out in culture about these type of issues? Are you not? It's amazing. I could mention a lot of other things that we could put into that verse, but just know this, the Greek word for immorality is everything outside of that one man, one woman covenant relationship. Now, notice it's, he has a relationship with his father's wife, meaning his stepmother. And we don't know all the details. We don't know, did his father die? We don't, we don't know those type of details. We just know that he's having a relationship that's outside the boundaries of Scripture, and Paul's calling the church to what? So there's two problems in chapter 5, two problems I want you to notice, and Paul gives a solution how to deal with it, and we have to look at uh, what the problem is. You might say, well, there's a problem right there. But I want you to look at where does he spend the majority of his time. Take a look at verse 2. You have become arrogant. And have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. He mainly spends most of the time on the church that's doing nothing about it. There are churches today who actually celebrate all kinds of sin in the church. And deem themselves, we are open and we're tolerant. I could show you videos that will turn your stomach. Of a pastor standing up in church. And saying outrageous things we celebrate these activities and you're like seriously why doesn't God like strike that down well because judgment day isn't here yet and we're living in a culture and he's getting onto the church because the church each church by the way I don't have authority over I'm a pastor I'm a shepherd over this church I can't go into another church downtown or anywhere in town and say man I can't believe what you're actually celebrating in church that you're condoning that you're saying we're very we're very progressive and it's things on which the Bible is crystal clear on crystal clear on and you're not doing anything actually you're doing the opposite what's going on in Corinth they may just say we're a grace filled church and we just let pretty much anything go and Paul's like what how many of you know work in a place where your workplace has standards? Have you ever seen anybody get fired at your workplace? If I said, let's take a, a moment and let's name some things that people you know got fired for, was it because they broke the company's standards? So companies, organizations, if you're part of some kind of organization, do they have some kind of standards or can you be a, a part of that organization and pretty much do whatever you want? So take a look at what he says, you become arrogant, and you're not mourning. You should be mourning over this. And he does mention that the person should be removed because they're not changing. Nothing is, so notice this, when you hear the word church discipline, it's only for those who are stubborn and unrepentant and basically say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. 
Imagine saying that at your workplace where you're, you're getting ready to get fired and they said, look, you're breaking our protocols, our rules. And you're like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And the work says, uh, yes, we can. We have certain standards. And you've broken our standards. And we've given you warning. And we've given you time for you to get things straightened out. And you have decided not to straighten any of it out, but to continue to continually be late for work. And our work starts at 7 o'clock. And you're abusing that. You're checking out. You're getting paid on the clock. How many work at a place where you have a punch card and you punch in and you punch out? What if you knew if somebody claimed to be a Christian and was giving somebody their punch card, they were leaving early and they have their friend punch out for them? How many would say that's unethical? How about if you're a Christian, you know somebody's a Christian and they're stealing tools and the justification is, oh, this place has billions of dollars. They won't miss it. What about if you have a guy who's an investment banker or investment person with one of the main investment places, and this is a true story, not, not in this town, but in another town, and he's a choir member, but he just, remember Bernie Madoff, who made off with millions? I thought that was an interesting last name. What, what if he was a church member? Does the church condone that activity, or do you allow Madoff to make off with $25 million or whatever? There was a guy in Iowa that that is exactly his story. Does the church just say, yeah, we, we're just a grace-filled church, you know? They're not mourning. There is a process, if you will. Let me have you turn to Matthew 18. It's not just Paul. It's not just Paul. It's Jesus. Jesus gave us a way in how to handle sin issues where people are not coming under conviction and not wanting to change. Jesus said, if your brother sins, go and show. It's not just for men, by the way. It's, you know Jesus when he's speaking. You can put in there him or her. <laughs> Their fault in private. In private. If he or she listens to you, look at the goal. What's the goal? The goal is restoration. We're in a community with one another. You go in private, and if he or she listens, you've won your brother. Hear the tone of that? You've won your brother. I want to be in a community that takes the Christian life seriously. So I'm, I'm committing myself to this congregation. Are you? That's what it means to be in congregational life together. We're doing life together. And you go in private. You go in humility, as Galatians chapter 6 says. You understand, Matthew 7, that take the log out of your own eye before you go. Make sure you're not a hypocrite. We're not talking about sinless perfection, but we're talking that you go in humility, and it's something serious that you need to deal with because you're like, as a Christian, this is an issue, and you go in humility, and let's talk about it. You may have coffee with them, and you meet for a couple times, and they're listening, and they're wrestling with these issues, and... They're like, you know what, you're right. I guess I didn't see that in my life. You've won your brother or sister. But what if they say, get lost? Who are you? Get lost. Get lo our, our society hates this kind of discussion. Right? It's an individualistic world and we'll do whatever we want. Okay, go in the world and do whatever you want. But workplaces and organizations and communities of faith have standards. So you take two more. If he or she doesn't listen to you, take one or two more with you. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. But if he or she refuses to listen to them, there's another opportunity. But if they refuse... So church discipline, the third point is, what? If he or she refuses to listen even to the church, do you let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector? Back then, tax collecting wasn't a good profession. What do you mean, let him be? My, my great aunt uh, is now with the Lord. She, she worked for the IRS, I, but she was a great believer. <laughs> I wonder if she really hated it when the pastor read this. <laughs> uh, under the Roman Empire, tax collectors were extortionists. You might say, well, that's for another topic, for another time, Okay. You turn them back over to the world. 
Why? Because they're refusing every opportunity. Back to Paul in 1 Corinthians 5. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who's committed this. This is a pretty clear case right here. How many would say this is a clear case? Right? Everybody on the same board? Do we need to go through any other scripture here? I think everybody's on. Yeah, this is serious. So I've already judged him who has committed this as though I were present in the name of our Lord Jesus because that's what a congregational, uh, congregational life is. We're here as Christians. When you are assembled and I with you in spirit because I started that church and my heart is there even though I'm up in Ephesus oh, with the power of our Lord Jesus. Here's the toughest verse in the whole chapter if not the whole book. I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So that his spirit, this sounds good, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Sounds redemptive. It sounds like let's do this in order for his spirit to be saved. So outside is the world, the realm of satanic influence. How many of you know, we, we live in a world that's filled with all kinds of evil. You tell me you don't believe in a satanic, diabolical, real person, being called Satan? I do. How do you explain Stalin? Now say dumb. How, do you, how, how, do you, how can you figure uh, a Hitler who killed six million Jews? By the way, Stalin killed millions, so did Mao Zedong. Grave, grave evil. It's hard to read about it. Paul's like, I'm putting you back. Evidently, you don't want to live out the Christian life. We're turning you back into the world, that satanic realm. And the goal here, and I'll have to confess, I'll give you a couple shots at what I think he's saying. As I tried to read a lot on this, basically two options. One is that he's a so-called brother, as we're going to see in the text. Verse 11 has that word so-called brother. I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. What do you mean so-called? Well, they say they are, but I don't know really if they are. I don't have an app on my phone where they could just put their hand on there. Whoop, it came up, ding, ding, ding. I don't have one of those things like you hook up on your car and it tells you what's going on. I don't have one of those. How many of you have people that you know that you really, they say they are, but you really doubt, you just don't know. God ultimately knows. Do you know anybody like that? Like, they say they are, but you just have never seen any fruit. You see a lot of negative fruit and you just really wonder. They say they are, like most Americans say they are. And so what he would be saying here, here is, the destruction of the flesh is that sinful nature because flesh is used in a few different ways in the New Testament. One, it means your physical flesh. But in other passages, the flesh has the idea of the unconverted nature. And we're going to turn you back out into the world and we're, we're praying by Satan's devices, persecution, whatever it might be, sickness, death is the ultimate, what some people would think. You'll come to your senses and turn to Lord Jesus. Because I think Paul is hopeful because he says, don't eat with him. Turn him back out into the world. Remove him from your midst. The other view is that he means death. <laughs> the destruction of his flesh that his soul might be saved because Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name do this? And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never what? I never knew you. The question is, does, can God take believers out? And so where that verse wouldn't become a reality. And it seems like, yeah, there are cases where God, if he desires, he's God. Can do that how many no matter what is paul is really getting at here know that this is not a good thing <laughs> right and it's not a good thing to, to be removed from god's influencing work and to be out on your own that should scare all of us this passage what it should do to real believers is say wow i need to be serious about my christian life 
because I'm in a relationship with other people in church and we hold ourselves accountable in a good way, that we care about each other's progress in the faith, please, you should say this, I invite it, if you come with the right motives. So you have discipline that's informal that happens every Sunday. Discipline's going on every Sunday. Do you know why? Every time the Bible's taught, it's disciplining on our mind to where I'm recognizing things and going, wow, that's an area I need to change. That's personal discipline. I am disciplining myself every time I open up that word and I'm reading it. You ever feel like sometimes the pastor's stepping on your toes? That's not me. It's the Holy Spirit through his word. And God is using it like what? Like the Holy Spirit is like getting your attention. Verse 6. Once again, you're boasting. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know? And this, some of you, if you're not, if you haven't been a Christian very long, you're like, I had no idea what this is talking about. Leaven and lumps and what? It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. Okay? This is the whole book of Exodus. And God leads, sets free the Jewish people to go to the promised land that God had promised them to go and serve him. But before he sets them free, redeems them, right? He says, I've got a little ritual for you. By the way, I just cooked pizza this week and I used yeast, leaven, and just a little bit. And I, I had some flour and water and oil and it's this big. And when I put that leaven in there, guess what happened? A few hours later, it's like five times as big. And what the Jews would do in a little ceremony before Passover, which is right around our Easter, okay? God said, I want you to do this. I want you to go through your kitchen. I want you to make sure. Now, they did it more like, how many did the sourdough starter thing where you got sourdough and, and you put it in uh, some fresh flour and then you put that sourdough, another piece, then you put it back in the fridge. Well, they didn't have refrigeration. So guess what would happen? That be, could become infected. And now you're just infecting your whole lump. So you got to get a new starter. Hey, I need a new starter. Mine started growing hair and looking green. I mean, right? You open up that fridge and you're like, something, right? That, so don't you know, and this tells you that you must deal with sin because it can affect people. Imagine if you say anything goes. Like, evidently was going on at Corinth. An abuse of grace. It infects others. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. And I should have had some fresh dough up here. It's an illustration, but I think you can visualize what he's saying. But notice what he says, just in fact, you are unleavened. Now, in this context, he's saying leaven represents sin. And he's saying, guys, you guys are a new lump. Are you a Christian? Well, you're a new lump in Christ. Because this, our, our Christ, our Passover lamb, he's been sacrificed for you. You've been bought, you've been cleansed, you've been forgiven. Is that true of you? then in fact you are unleavened. Then why are you allowing the leavening effect to come into your community? It's really beautiful. Now, he, you have to know a little bit of the Old Testament. And maybe Paul, when he was there for a year and a half, that he was teaching them the Old Testament. So he's bringing some of these to mind as a visual illustration. But the illustration is the point that if you don't deal with sin, it is going to start to affect other people. And then what's going to happen? Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with all leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Let's celebrate it with this, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's continue as Christians to celebrate break Christ, our Passover lamb, for our sins. And let's celebrate. We're not going to go home and sweep out, even though I spilled some of my yeast and it got on the floor. I'm not really worried about it because Pam's got one of these little things that goes around, sucks it all up, right? I'm not going to go home and make sure I, I get every crevice clean. We're going to continue to celebrate that ritual 
by recognizing who I am in Christ and remember this, that Christ Jesus died for me. How can we, Paul says in Romans 6, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we say that I'm a Christian and Jesus had to bear the wrath of God for every sin of mine? And I'm just, I had a lady tell me one time years ago, years ago, she's no longer, I'm not going to go into much detail, but remember this, she just said this, I love sin and God loves to forgive. That's probably the mindset of Corinth. I love to sin. God loves to forgive. What's wrong with that statement? Wow. Just trample over the blood of Christ. Oh, I got a ticket? Or does the Bible call us to a new life? And folks, we're not talking about, okay, how many during COVID, like Pam and I took a trip to Fort Sill? My, my, my son-in-law was in the Army, and he was deployed to another country, and Anyway, when he was getting back, we had their second car. And so we're during COVID, when you're not supposed to travel anywhere, don't let anybody know you're going out, we kept it kind of secret because we didn't want judged by a bunch of people. Oh, you got out during COVID? Yeah, we were very careful. You know, if somebody asked us, oh, we were very careful. Right? We had a porta potty and everything, and every once in a while we'd stop at a gas station. Use it. But I say all that to say this you're afraid you're going to be judged by everybody. You went down that far? Remember, this is right. How many know when COVID first came out, everybody was, was highly sensitive about this? Well, you don't let them know that you went anywhere unless you would be what? Judge. And how many of you felt like, oh, no. Even after I had COVID, I was out, and I know somebody was judging me and wondering how come I was out. And I almost wanted to say, I'm tested and I'm free now. <laughs> Because I knew I was being judged. What are you doing out? I had a mask even. Are we talking about that kind of atmosphere? Where we're just feeling judged and oh no? No. We're talking about unrepentant, overt sins. The church just can't sweep under the rug. How many of you do that with stuff? You just sweep it under the rug. Thinking it's not, it comes. my wife's not home. I'm just going to sweep it under the rug. Until she trips over that big lump in the rug. Right? Verse 9, they took it too far. I wrote, to you, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I love this. I didn't mean with immoral people of the world. With the covetous, the swindlers, idolaters. Why? Because you'd have to go live on another planet. You'd have to go out of this world. I didn't mean the immoral people of the world. How many of you have businesses where you do business with people of all kinds of backgrounds? And you treat them with respect because they're made in the image of God. They're a human. They're not claiming to be Christian, and they're going to live all kinds of life. And remember, Paul says, I didn't mean with them. You've got to serve them and work around them. Right? Go to the retirement parties. Go visit them in the hospital. Go to their son's ball game. I didn't mean those people. What I actually meant... I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother who's an immoral person, covetous, idolater, reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat such one. If you are showing table fellowship and you're acting like nothing's wrong, have you gone to them? Have you gone to them? Have you gone, taken two? And if not, you have to do the final thing. As long as they're unrepentant, what kind of relationship are you having with them? If everybody just has a, a, an ongoing relationship with them and eating out with them and, and just acting like everything's fine, when you know it's not fine. That's what he's talking about. How many know this is hard to do? It takes a lot of grace, of understanding, Lord, how do I do this? How do I continue to reach out if, if they're wanting to repent and turn and by the way, the door is always open. In chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe this guy turns around. If you've got your Bibles open, I'll just read it. I'll tell you what, I think the guy turned around. Because, listen to this in chapter 2. Chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. This very thing I wrote to you so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you, all that my joy would be the joy of all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote with many tears. 
not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. And if any have caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not only to me, but in some degree in order to not say too much to all of you. Sufficient, here it is, verse 6. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. That's the church. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Look at this. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end, I wrote you so that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. But to the one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. Now, I just I, I think what happened, and so we, we have to say this, what happens when somebody, let's say they're removed, and they come to their senses like, I, I want to be with the people of God. Reaffirm your love. Reaffirm your love. So does this give you a better picture of what's going on? It's to the one who says, no, I'm going to do it my way. You say, well, if you're going to do it your way, you're not wanting to live out the Christian faith, then step out into the world because you can't do both. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Coming back to that whole thing, we're not talking about those on the outside. You'd have to go live on the moon, folks. And to, to the, right now, I don't think they've come up with that technology, even though some have claimed, I think Elon Musk might be close, you know, he could give us a trip, we could all go live on the moon. And then what would you have on the moon? You would have the same people and the same problem, that would be us. But I love how he writes that. He's saying as Christians, you now have a new purpose and a new identity and new ethics. How many relate to this? See, when I, when I got saved, I got a new whole new downloaded ethical system in which to live, and it is much better than the world system to live. I have much better peace. How many know when you live the way God wants you to live, there is more joy and peace found there than living any way you want? And here's the thing. A true born-again person, if I said, how many of you walked away from following God, and I've heard this so many times, it was miserable. I've heard it many times. I stepped away and backslid, call it, went back and lived in the world. And it was miserable because God disciplines those he, whom he loves. And he might use all kinds of things to discipline and bring us back. Do I have anybody that can testify to that? Nobody can testify. It, it's miserable. When you're truly a Christian and you're not living the way the Lord wants you to live, it's miserable. Okay, good. We can move on. It is. Is it not? Can I hear an amen? That it's miserable. The most happy, peaceful, blessed life is saying, Lord, you're the giver of life. You've written the manual. And to live for you with your people, it is truly the best way to live. So, God handles the outside. We handle the what? We've got to handle the inside. So let me, let me summarize this. The purpose of, uh, this is in our Constitution and bylaws, just trying to summarize. The purpose of such discipline, which must be administered in humility and love, is A, for repentance, reconciliation, spiritual growth of the individual. It's, right? Purpose of winning them. B, the instruction in righteousness and good of other Christians as an example to them. So church discipline is done for the repentance, reconciliation, spiritual growth of the individual. It's also good for instruction and in righteousness and good for other Christians. Look what text, and this was done in 2003. Notice first one, 1 Corinthians 5 and Matthew 18. Second one, 1 Corinthians 5 and many other texts. Also for the purity of the church as a whole, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, illustration in 6, to, 6 and 7. For the good of our corporate witness to non-Christians. Supremely, last of all, for the glory of God by reflecting his holy character. Now, how many of you are like, whew, I'm glad that's over. 
Now, the question, folks, let, let me close with this. The question today is, do we believe this? What are we going to do with this? Are we going to be like Corinth? Or are we going to say, Lord, by your grace, I pray that we can do it biblically. Can it be done wrongly? Absolutely. And my prayer is, my prayer is that you would read through the back sheet with the 10 questions this week. Allow the Holy Spirit to be working. Let's pray together. Lord, as your people, we want to live lives that glorify you by living out a new ethical system. We thank you for this new life in Christ. And we pray, God, by your grace, that as believers that assemble here, we would be able to do life together, to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens, to fight sin together corporately as a body, and yes, Lord, even be held accountable for our own good, for the good of the rest of the body, and for your glory. Give us wisdom in all these things. Lord, we pray today, if, if I pray that if the Holy Spirit's speaking, knocking on the door of hearts, that you're using that as a personal discipline for them. And we will give you praise because it's being stopped in the heart and mind without anybody else even knowing it. Lord, we thank you how you do that in so many ways. Lord, we love you, and now as we come to partake of the Lord's Supper, we pray it would be a moving experience as we hold the cup and we hold the bread, that we would stand in awe of what you've accomplished to save us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.